Hey folks, welcome back to the show. I hope you like statistical and applied mathematical sciences because that's what the next month is all about. That's right, it's Samsy, Samsy, Samsy all the way. And a new episode on Samsy's precision medicine research every week for over a month. So what is Samsy? I'm glad you asked. Samsy is a collaboration between Duke, UNC Chapel Hill, NC State University, and the National Science Foundation based in the Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And they've recently had a major research focus on precision medicine. So I thought it'd be good to catch up on the variety of research themes that they've covered. So if that sounds cool, don't forget to subscribe and click that bell button to hear when more of the episodes come out. And today's hitherto silent guest is the whole Samsey package right there, John Nardini. He works in mathematical bottling of wound healing. Um, so he's got the science, he's got the math, but he's also making headway in machine learning to expedite the comparison of these mathematical models, in particular under different noise regimes and other complicating factors like that. So what's cool about John's work is at least three things, in my opinion. First, his mathematical modeling approach is a bit different from the statistical approach to modeling that many of us are used to. So it's a different approach to familiar challenges. But this is also interesting because it means he's sitting a little bit more directly at the interaction between these formal deductive sciences and the biological sciences to which these methods are applied. So it gives us plenty to think about in that regard. And finally, and this is a big one, he just does a really good job of presenting his work, showing his algorithms in action. So this is an audio interview, but for his next part coming out next week, be sure to catch on YouTube because it's a great presentation, got a lot of cool video and visuals. So uh, definitely hop onto YouTube for that one. And so there you go, John Nardini coming up. John Nardini, maybe you could tell us a bit about your research at SAMSI and NC State? Yeah, so right now I'm a postdoctoral scholar at both SAMSI and NC State University, and I'm in a precision medicine program at both these institutions. And my research interest really is to use mathematical modeling to better understand biological phenomena. So what this means is that we often want to come up with mathematical models that we can easily either analyze their properties or simulate them numerically to provide insight into biological processes where maybe these experiments are expensive or very time consuming to perform. Whereas, you know, on a computer, we can simulate these things and different hypotheses very, very quickly. So one of the things that I think is most interesting about your work and more generally the mathematical modeling approach to describing biological systems is how you approach the model of the system in comparison to the data that you are measuring from the system. For my own work, for example, we certainly do wish to formalize and describe many of the data generative processes that again, create our data, but at the same time, we want to have the model be loose enough that really we let the data speak for itself as to what the key dynamics are. We spend quite a bit of time trying to make the models, for example, one of the key values of having non-parametric models is that we aren't imputing these heavy-handed assumptions on the dynamic processes that we're trying to model. In contrast, it seems like the mathematical approach is that we are defining and quantifying these processes a priori, and then we see deductively the end result from what we've assumed these physiological processes to be. And I guess one thing that I'm not quite clear on is how do you take the mathematical model that you've defined a priori and then compare it to the data that you have for measuring the system? Where does the data fit in? Is it simply parameterizing aspects of the mathematical model that you've defined? Or is there some other interaction between the a priori model and the data that I'm missing? Yeah. So towards the end of this and in the more detailed talk that I give later on, I'll actually be talking about how we're trying to bring this methodology to the approach that you're talking about, where we sort of make inference directly from the data. But in general, the way that the math biology field works at the moment is that we want to come up with some mathematical model that can suitably describe a given biological phenomena. And this is why it's so important in my field of mathematical biology to work very close in collaboration with biologists and experimentalists 
and just people who can give us insights into what is actually going on in this biological world. And as you sort of mentioned, Glenn, what we typically do is we sort of say, okay, I think I have an understanding of this process, and so I'm going to make this assumption, this assumption, and this other assumption, and now I'm going to bring these together and sort of churn through some calculus, and out I'm going to pop some mathematical model that is the result of these different hypotheses that I put into this mathematical model. And then often what we do is we have some small data from the ex some preliminary experiments that we do want to see how the mathematical model can describe this biological phenomena. And so what we do is we actually do simulations of this mathematical model that we've come up with to see how well they can either predict or describe the given data set. And there are many different approaches to doing this actually, where often these mathematical models require parameters. For example, if you have a population that is growing over time, you may want to know, well, what is the rate of the population's growth? Or with my partial differential equation models, we have populations that are spreading over time. And you need to know, well, how fast, how quickly is my biological population spreading over time? And there are generally two different ways that mathematicians go about getting these parameters. Either we can do a thorough search of the literature and find what biological experiments suggest these parameters might be. Or we can fully estimate these parameters, whether in a Bayesian technique like you mentioned, or a frequentist technique to get a point estimate. And our general goal with mathematical modeling, whether we get these parameters from biological experiments or from actually doing parameter estimation, is to really use these mathematical models that we've come up with to then be able to predict and explain biological data. But as you mentioned, it's sort of in your work, you kind of try to make inference about the system from the data itself. And that's what my big research interest is at the moment is, you know, we have to make all these assumptions to come up with these mathematical models, but is there any way to not have to make these assumptions on our own and instead let the data tell us what sort of assumptions we should be making about it? And so this is during my postdoc brought me into a field of machine learning that I would call equation learning where we want to infer the partial differential equation model that can best describe a given data set, not from our own assumptions, but from using methods of machine learning to learn them from the data itself. That's really cool. And just so we understand, uh, when we're talking about some of the parameters that you're trying to estimate and how they relate to the theme of personalized medicine, do these parameter estimations, are you also looking at sort of, there's the population-based estimate of these parameters from either experiments or studies. And then part of the precision element is also trying to figure out if there's personalized elements that an individual model isn't just describing the population as a whole, but how an individual might react or be modeled by these mathematical equations? Yeah, that's a great question. And with lots of different studies of this nature, it often depends on, you know, just how detailed the data is that you're working with. Often we maybe are working with biological data where maybe we have the exact same experimental protocol that's been done three times over, in which case we're not really so much interested in where along the entire possible distribution does our experiment fall. In that case, we may just be interested in getting the individual estimates from these three separate trials. But in the talk that'll be given later on, we'll be talking about about some work that I've been doing with oncologists at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. And they have a huge collection of MRI data from a variety of different patients of glioblastoma, which is a very harmful cancer of the brain. And so then when you have access to a very high fidelity data set in terms of different types of patients or something of that nature, then you really can try and infer not just what do parameters look like for one individual experiment or patients, but you can also try and infer what the sort of population level parameters may look like, as well as their distributions. And we haven't been able to work on this yet, but something we talk about all the time is using something like a nonlinear mixed effects modeling technique to be able to look at not just individual parameter estimates for patients, but also what the overarching population distributions may look like for these biologically realistic parameters. You work in so many cool things that it would be really great to get more of a survey or an overview of all the different biological processes or biological phenomena that you've modeled through your mathematics. But before we do that, one thing that I think is really interesting, one thing I've always wondered is, 
how as a mathematician do you select the biological application areas and the biological processes that are most apt for mathematical modeling, for example, as opposed to more apt for a statistical approach or a machine learning approach? What is the art and what is the science in selecting a specific biological process and knowing this is a very promising area where a mathematical approach in particular can be very useful? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if I've ever been asked that before. In general, I guess when we look at a given biological phenomena and we want to know, can mathematics help us understand this? What we need is data that when we look at the data, it looks like something that we know we can describe through mathematics. And it has to look like it's a little bit predictable so that we can understand what the dynamics are and nothing too crazy is going on in the background. Now, in terms of what sort of biological phenomena I'm interested in working with, my PhD dissertation was focused on experiments to imitate the wound healing process. So most of us have previous experience with wound healing where we know that if we have a cut or a scrape to our skin, we know that our skin cells kind of magically know how to restore the integrity of the skin all by itself. But it turns out that this process is a pretty complicated scenario with many different overlapping stages. And in particular, there are some small incidents where the wound healing process fails, which we call a non-healing wound. And these have been a pretty significant burden to the U.S. healthcare system, where 1-2% to of the population will experience a non-healing wound during the course of their lifetime. And this can lead to really big complications because it then leads to further infection of the wound. And in worst case scenarios can lead to amputation. And non-healing wounds also cost the U.S. healthcare system $19 billion annually. And despite the prevalence of these non-healing wounds, we really have very limited understanding of why they occur or how to prevent them from occurring. So instead, we're more interested in using mathematical modeling to provide us with more insight into healthy wound healing dynamics in hopes that if we understand what's going on with healthy wound healing dynamics, then we can also understand what's going wrong with these non-healing wounds and how to address them. And so the sort of wound healing experiments that I worked on during my dissertation are called scratch assays. And they're, from a biological standpoint, somewhat simple, where they take human skin cells and they put them into a well plate and just sort of grow an artificial population of cells. And then they just scratch away half of the cell population to imitate a wound. And then we can use imaging techniques to just take images of the cell population as it migrates into this artificial wound that we created experimentally. And indeed, we see that by just scratching away half the population, the cells will move into this empty space like they do in the wound healing process. And so this was something during my dissertation that we identified as a reliable system that we had some intuition would be a good system that could be described with mathematical models. Modeling. And then I also mentioned that we're also working currently in collaboration with oncologists from the Mayo Clinic. And this is for glioblastoma, which is a very harmful brain cancer. And what glioblastoma tends to do is these cancerous cells inside the brain either spread to new areas of the brain or they divide and the population grows very quickly. And so those are types of phenomena where we have very good mathematical models for those types of processes. And so because we already sort of know some mathematical models that we think could describe that process, that's how we identify glioblastoma as a good model system to use our mathematical models for. Well, that's really cool. Just uh, not to name drop, John, but you know, uh, Henry VIII mm -hmm. uh, had a perpetual non-healing wound for like the second half of his life. <laughs> yeah, it's why his apparently his leg smelled really bad from a jousting accident that it just never healed. And actually, as you mentioned that, why... Um, wounds are so relatable as a subject. I was actually uh, looking down at my hand, which has, I uh, recently cut myself, uh, and like most millennials who cut themselves, I did it while preparing an avocado. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, definitely, um, I do like that. And it also, I think the audience can really appreciate the elements that you're bringing here, where basically, like for example, if you think about the wound system, what you essentially, what it sounds like you're doing is you are recreating in vitro mm -hmm. this sort of baseline state and a wounding process and then modeling the dynamics after the wounding process happens. And it seems, I guess, difficult. You can certainly understand your intuition behind saying, yeah, I think that we can sort of, we know basically how these wounds will come back together. Presumably we know some elements of the geometry and the interaction between points, uh, between the different cells and the different elements in this. And therefore, 
you can sort of provide, the mathematics provides a reasonable deductive element to how these things might proceed from the point of wound. And then I guess, is it using the data to see if, well, this model work inductively to describe the situation? Yeah, that's precisely it, where we can look at the wound healing process and it seems like the rules should be simple enough where if a cell sees empty space, it knows to move towards that empty space. And it was just making those types of assumptions only slightly more complicated that, that got me my PhD dissertation. So yeah, we see things that appear to be simple rules and we just mathematize it. And that's when we think we have a system that can be described mathematically. Well, that's one of the fun things or maybe more sweat inducing things about the rigor of mathematics where you can take these simple rules and the moment you take one or two steps further out into the wilderness, it goes from being very simple and deductive to just being a massive challenge. Yeah, that's precisely it, because with that sort of simple assumption of if I have a cell and it moves towards empty space, that leads to a mathematical model that's pretty simple for someone to interpret like myself. But I just had to add one assumption to those rules, and then I had a mathematical model that was very difficult to interpret, and that's why it took me five years to get my PhD, because I took all that time analyzing this one equation. Well, I'm sure that there are many clinicians and statisticians and other data analyzers who are very grateful to have you sweating it out on the mathematical equations. I sure hope so. On the issue of the challenges while we're talking about them, what are some of the warning signs or the challenges for math's ability to represent biological processes? Like, are there certain just deal breakers that you can identify a priori? Or are these things that sort of have to be discovered in time? I assume it's a combination of them, but which are there sort of warning signs that you would identify in advance to say, this is probably not a good process for us to model mathematically. It doesn't either work deductively or whatever mathematics we come back with might have very like challenging inductive elements to be useful. Well, what are the different warning signs? Usually the worst warning sign is, you know, we work very closely with, with these collaborators, our experimental collaborators, and usually they have several plausible hypotheses of what do they think is driving the observed phenomena. And I think one of these hypotheses is the correct explanation for what we observe. And so that's when mathematical modeling is good, because then we can actually quantify each one of these different hypotheses and compare them to the data and say, oh, look, we had, you know, these small number of hypotheses, we simulated them. And this one, based on this one hypothesis, is the one that was able to best predict the experimental data. So now we have reason to believe that that was the best one. And so then what is very challenging for mathematicians is when we work with these collaborators and they see something that's going on, and when we ask them, well, what do you think is going on? And they say, well, we have no idea what's going on. Because then you don't even know what sort of rules to maybe start formulating to describe this process. But while this may sound like an area where mathematical modeling is useless, sometimes this also leads to the most rewarding studies of all, because maybe we have no idea why something is happening. And then that lets us get creative and think a little bit outside the box, maybe even come up with our own hypotheses for what's going on. And then that's when we really start to come up with new insight from mathematical models. So that's sort of the challenge is sometimes you think you know what's going on and that can help you. And sometimes you have no idea what's going on, but that can actually lead to the most informative studies for yourself or the cases where mathematical modeling is a truly vital tool for biologists. So I guess when a subject domain expert doesn't give you a lot of guidance or many assurances, does it sort of give you an opportunity to let your imagination run wild, select the mathematics that you find most useful, select the sort of intuition that you think might bring you the farthest? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's easier to work with a collaborator when they have these sort of straightforward things that they want to, to see happen. But yeah, definitely when they have no idea what's going on is when we really get to get creative and try new things. Actually, for over a year of my PhD work, during this wound healing process, I was under the impression that interactions between cells made it harder for cells to move into the wound healing area. And this kept leading to me working with mathematical models that just could not describe the data. And I kept thinking to myself, like, you know, this just doesn't make sense. Like, I'm doing all the things that are supposed to be true, yet... I can't describe this data, so something's got to be wrong. And finally, one day, it just clicked in my head to say, 
well, what if it's not true that these cell-cell interactions make it harder for cells to migrate into the wound? What if instead these cell-cell interactions actually make it easier for cells to move into the wound by working together? And that turned out to be the exactly correct thing to get a mathematical model that could provide us with a lot of insight into the wound healing process. And so this was exactly a scenario that you're talking about where I didn't really have much insight into what was going on, but mathematical modeling was the perfect tool to eventually figure out what was going on. And a bit, I had to think outside the box to get there. Yeah, that really is a good example where mathematics provides you with the logical framework to essentially debug your assumptions. Just to put that within the context of the rest of your mathematical modeling, when you said that your assumption was that these cell-to-cell interactions was harmful to the process, or I guess slowed the process, Mm -hmm. and instead hypothesized that they could actually improve or speed up the process. Was that a parameter change, or is it a change in your baseline system? How does that actually translate into the model? I see. That leads to a completely different modeling framework, actually, where when I thought that connections between cells make it harder for the cells to move into the wound, I sort of programmed that assumption into a mathematical model and then did some calculus to get the resulting partial differential equation model for that process. But then when I sort of had that breakthrough one day where I thought, well, maybe it's not that they prevent cells from moving into the wound, and maybe they're actually a way that cells help others move into the wound area. I then sort of had to go back before doing all that calculus and change these sort of rules between individual cells in my models, and then go back and do the calculus again to get a different type of modeling framework. And on the issue of various assumptions, you've also done quite a bit of work on, as you mentioned before, examining different biological processes under different assumptions. So essentially, I guess, comparing different mathematical models with assumptions. Could you tell us a little bit about that research? So yeah, so during my PhD, I sort of went down two different roads of what you're talking about. The first sort of process was comparing two different hypotheses to explain a biological process with different mathematical models. So this sort of goes back to the framework of, you know, do these connections between, or do these interactions between cells make it easier or harder for cells to move into the wound healing area? And so what I actually did to prove that cells indeed help each other move into the wound area by interacting with their neighbors was I compared two different models where these two models were derived from either assuming that cells prevent others from moving into the wound or that cells help each other move into the wound. And what I was able to show mathematically was that the mathematical model that assumes cells help others move into the wound area did a much better job at describing our experimental data of this process than the analogous mathematical model that assumed that these connections between cells make it harder for their neighbors to move into the wound healing area. And so mathematically, this is what we call a model comparison study where we sort of translate two different hypotheses into mathematical models. And in general, what we say is that the mathematical model that can more suitably describe the given experimental data sets is the correct modeling process. And so this first study was one way in which I talked about, um, indeed, cells interact with their neighbors to help others move into the wound area. But then alternatively, you also mentioned how we can sort of perturb the experiments to see what will go on. And another question that our collaborators talked with me about during my PhD dissertation was that not only are cells interacting with their neighbors during the wound healing process, but we can treat these experiments with different types of chemicals and we'll see very different rates of migration into the wound healing area. And this was really interesting because what we observe is that by treating these cell populations with different types of chemicals or with different patterns of these chemicals, we see that their rates of migration change pretty drastically during the experiment, which told us that the behavior of cells can change pretty drastically based on the chemicals we give cells as well as the patterns with which we treat these cell populations. But the previous mathematical modeling frameworks that were used for these types of experiments didn't really consider that cells might change their behavior. And so I was able to sort of quantify this with a different type of mathematical modeling framework, where I now considered not just cells that are migrating into the wound area over time, but also changing their behavior based on the present chemicals in in their environment. Um, And so this led to a whole new type of partial differential equation modeling framework, where we could also talk about not just patterns of cell migration, 
but also how chemical concentration can change these rates of migration into the wound area. Just to be clear, are these sort of the chemicals in the environment of the cells, are these supposed to be like treatments or are they more like biological residues and other things like that or some combination of the two? It would be an either or for that. So I guess I should back up a step and say in these scratch assay experiments that I was modeling for my dissertation, there is only one type of skin cell that we're considering in these experiments to make them as simple as possible. But this is, of course, a pretty drastic oversimplification of true in vivo wound healing in our cells. Because if you looked at a cross section of your skin, there are several different layers of the skin. And so we're really only imitating how the most external part of our skin migrates into the wound area. And as you mentioned, really during the wound healing process, there's a lot of communication that's going on between different cell populations. So one sort of explanation for these different chemical concentrations during our experiments is that these chemicals would be supplied to these outermost skin cell types from a different type of skin cell type. Maybe it's skin cells that are deeper inside the layers of skin, or maybe it's from cells from the immune system that sort of entered the wound area to sort of clean up the wound and then tell these skin cells to start migrating. So it's definitely to, in part, to better mimic the true wound healing that goes on inside of our healthy cells. But also earlier on, I mentioned non-healing wounds, in which case these cell types fail to heal. And so the idea here is that, of course, we may want to model the scenario where we use some sort of topical treatments that involves these chemicals to get these cell populations to actually heal when under normal circumstances, they may not heal. And so the idea for this framework is that it could both describe the actual dynamics of healthy wound healing or they could imitate a clinical trial to try and get these cell, these non-healing wounds to properly heal. So some subjects that we haven't touched on much yet are parameterization and equation learning. How does that fit into your work? Well, you see, more often than not, we think we know what's going on inside of the experimental process. But the truth is, you know, our skin cells don't care what we think they're doing. They just do their own thing. And there are definitely situations in the literature where we've had mathematical models that we thought could suitably describe a given process. And then down the road, maybe 10 years later or something, we realize, oh, those assumptions we made were completely wrong, and we have been using the incorrect model for the past 10 years because of that. And this happens, it's, it's part of the scientific process. So now we're also sort of interested in, well, what do we do when we don't know what's going on in the experimental system? Or is there a way for us to ensure that the mathematical model that we're using really is the best mathematical model to describe this system? And so this is how we sort of come into the equation learning field of machine learning, where our goal is to observe a given data set to mimic maybe a biological process or something of that nature, and then use machine learning to infer the best model out of many different possible models to provide us with insight into this process. So equation learning sort of takes, it removes the burden on us to sort of say what the underlying processes for this biological process are. And instead, if these methods can reliably work, then we just have to use this framework, infer the mathematical model that can best describe a data set. And then as experts in this field, we can say, oh, I recognize this mathematical model that says that, you know, these cells are spreading with this sort of rate and maybe they're also dividing with some other rates. So it's just a different way to test what's actually going on inside an experiment. So just to ask a more big picture question, where do you see statistics and machine learning models adding to the mathematical approaches like the ones that you use? Is it for learning new parameterizations in the model and quantifying the uncertainty around those parameterizations? Or is it trying to find new ways to automate the selection process between a variety of equations so you can consider more potential mathematical equations at once as plausible representatives of as plausible descriptors of the biological process? Or is it things like you want to use them to better interpolate between real world observations so that you can give more data by which to measure the modeling accuracy of your mathematical models? You know, where broadly is machine learning likely to contribute and where does it already have some success stories? Yeah, so probably your question alone is a big area of research over the next few years with, you know, this whole data revolution that we've been experiencing over the past 10 years. 
I think a really big question that we're always constantly trying to answer is where is machine learning a valuable resource for and where is it not a valuable resource for? So I think if you asked a mathematical modeler today, they would probably say that mathematical modeling doesn't really need machine learning for things such as parameter estimation or um, uncertainty quantification. But I think this area of equation learning is very valuable for us because machine learning is suited to work in high dimensional situations where, for example, with when we're trying to come up with mathematical models to describe a given process, there's a huge number of mathematical models that could or could not explain the process very well. And so I'll get into this a little bit with my slides later on, but what the premise here is that, you know, if we have several plausible explanations for a given data set, but no idea which ones are true or not, we could very quickly find ourselves with tens or maybe even hundreds of mathematical models that maybe could describe a given data set. And it'll take someone years to go through each one of these individual models and compare them to data, especially if you want to do this accurately. And this is the sort of area where machine learning is great for because methods from machine learning can go through these large number of scenarios pretty quickly. And so this, I think, is where machine learning will be very valuable for mathematical modeling because it can sort of go through these many possible assumptions for us so that we don't have to go through them, which would be a very long and time-consuming process. Well, I don't want to delay any more from seeing your presentation because I think the audience is going to be eager to see this now. What you're describing is so cool. But before we hop over to your presentation in your technical deep dive, just very quickly, you mentioned the data revolution in your field. And I was just curious, where is the data revolution coming from in your field? Is it the digitization of lab data, for example, or is it that you have more population surveys and things like that? Where is your data, presumably digital data, coming from? And why is it more abundant now? I think data is more abundant now because we have better ways to actually analyze data. And again, I guess this goes back to machine learning and our intelligence and those things. But for example, working in areas of mathematical modeling for cell biology, it used to be that you know maybe we have an experimental image of a cell population over time. And the experimentalists used to have to take these images and hand count the number of cells over time or you know, by hand to pick out, okay, there's a cell at this location and this location, this location, and that location. Whereas now methods of machine learning are making these processes automatic. And so now we can spend a lot more time actually collecting experiments and doing them in high throughput. Whereas previously, you know, we maybe had to spend more time doing this manual labor to actually go from images or experimental data to other types of data that are more amenable to analysis with a mathematical model. Well, I really like and appreciate that example because uh, one time I had to spend a week as that person with the clicker <laughs> counting the cells. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I definitely appreciate that and how I did not mind being replaced by a machine in that task. But without further ado, let's hop over to your technical presentation. John, thanks so much for your time, and I will see you in the next part. Okay, sounds good. Well, that's it for this episode of The Pod of Asclepius. We hope you enjoyed it and will tune in for our next episode. If you're watching from YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and leave a like. You can also follow us on our other social media channels, including LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. Have a great story or presentation that's ready for prime time? Or know someone who does? Drop Glenn an email because he'd be happy to hear from you. We would like to thank our sponsors from the American Statistical Association section on Statistical Learning and Data Science, section on Medical Devices and Diagnostics, and North Carolina Chapter. The views expressed on the show are those of the speaker and not their employers, our sponsors, or anyone else not saying the words.